Allegations concern female students attending the same school. The district also stated that in the Schools Act, a criminal charge, however serious, does not authorize removal of a student. The accused male is currently not attending Stephenville High. But some students feel the district should do more to protect the victims. So there's a silent protest organized for Wednesday. We're hoping that the school board takes notice and really sees just how much the people in this school are afraid and want things to change. Keynes wants a strict school board policy so something like this doesn't happen in the future. Now, if this accused male does decide to return to school, the school district will inform the victims of his return, and they will also put safety measures in place at the school. Live in Cornerbrook, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. There were tears at the Ann Norris murder trial in St. John's this afternoon as the defense began its case. Norris's father, Gary, told the court about how his daughter went from being an outgoing, confident child to a young woman who slipped into mental illness. Here now's Glenn Payette reports. Ann Norris cried as she listened to her father's testimony, and Gary Norris had to fight back tears and compose himself several times. Ann Norris is on trial charged with the first-degree murder of Marcel Reardon in St. John's two years ago. She admits she killed him with a hammer, but says she isn't criminally responsible because of a mental disorder. Today, the defense put Gary Norris on the stand to begin making that case. He told the court that problems began in 2011 when his daughter made a complaint to the police that a former coach of hers had sexually assaulted her when she was a girl. The court has already learned that there was a significant investigation and no charges were ever laid. Norris said his daughter told him the former coach was following her in a van and that someone was putting something in her coffee. He said he told her it wasn't true, that it was just anxiety. He said his daughter accused a boyfriend of breaking into her apartment and raping her and that he had a gun. Norris said he knew in his heart of hearts it wasn't true. There was no sign of a break-in. He said he told the police his daughter was having mental health issues. Norris also said Anne accused him of shaving her face when she was asleep and that she had AIDS, even though she never went to a doctor or was tested. He said once, when they wouldn't admit her to the Waterford Hospital, she said she was going to kill herself and took all her medication and had to have her stomach pumped. Norris also said that Anne got to the point where she wouldn't take her meds because she didn't want to go to sleep out of fear that someone would attack her. He said over time he found a small baseball bat, steak knife, and a very real-looking BB gun under her bed. Norris said he eventually took the handgun. He said he was afraid that she might end up in an altercation with the police and get shot. The defense continues its case tomorrow. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. An afternoon boil up on the outskirts of St. John's took a scary turn yesterday. A family from Mount Pearl was having a campfire near Cochran Pond when they came under fire. Wayne Soper wants the public to know what happened. He took here and now back to the campsite today to share his story. Uh, well, we heard it earlier uh, and being a hunter, I, I know what the sound of gunfire is, but I didn't pay attention because I thought it was a hunter. Uh, so probably 30 minutes after that, uh, we could hear the bullets coming through the woods. Uh, I immediately told my wife and nephew to hit the dirt, which I've never said in my life before. And uh, I could hear them going by me, so I went down and the three of us ended up over here by these trees. And uh, we basically were yelling out, thinking again it was a hunter and uh, the bullets stopped and then they started again so it was probably around 10 to 15 each each occasion and uh, being a hunter myself and hear that type of rapid fire is not normal when you're hunting unless you're hunting a herd of something uh, and when you call out which is normal practice because someone could be lost in the woods and not realize where they're shooting a hunter will typically stop and uh, have a look around but these these bullets stopped it was almost like a reload and then it started again I had four, uh, four bullets in the front of my uh, truck, two in the bumper, one in the light, and one in the grill. And the truck is fairly close, so uh, I can only assume they were hitting the truck and then the bullets were coming through here at us. And that's why I, I 
brought it to the public is because this road is, is used a lot on the weekends and uh, we had talked to people with their dogs uh, probably 20 minutes prior to this. A lot of bikes back and forth and every time you see one there's either a husband and wife or a, a child on, on the bike so I felt it was a, a high used area and to have gunfire fire at 2.30 in the afternoon just doesn't seem right. Pretty scary, a little bit eerie to be back here today to be honest with you but uh, it won't deter me from going out and enjoying nature. It's just one of those things. It's one of those uh, one or two percent people that, if they were firing bullets at people, had no respect for other people. I would, I would come forward. I, I would come forward and say, if you're out and you had a, you're hunting and making a mistake, I would just come out, let people know that there's no risk to anybody, and you were making a mistake, and and get that message out. Now, uh, Soper said police responded to his call immediately and seized his vehicle as part of their investigation. Because those bullets struck the engine of his truck, he's been advised not to drive it. The RNC says it's still investigating the incident and it's not yet known if the shooting was accidental or intentional. Opponents have demanded it for years, and now a forensic audit will be done into the Muskrat Falls project. It will be part of the inquiry ordered by the provincial government. The examination of financial information will focus on two areas. Here now is Peter Cowan is live in our newsroom with details. Peter, what areas are going to be examined? Debbie, they are going to be looking at two areas, one that was before the project was sanctioned and one that's happened after that. And all this is going to be up to Grant Thornton, the accounting firm that's been hired by the inquiry to do this investigation. So the first area is the analysis that was done before the decision was made to go ahead with Muskrat Falls. It'll be looking at the sort of accounting and financial information, the projections that they were looking at, see whether or not anyone put their finger on the scale to tip it in favor of Muskrat Falls. The second area is going to be looking at the costs after the project was sanctioned. By now we all know how the project has ballooned in cost from originally just over $7 billion to now almost $13 billion. So Grant Thornton will have to pour through all that information and look at exactly where all that money went to figure out if anything was done wrong here. The audit will be completely independent from the inquiry, but the inquiry says it will use its legal powers in order to compel any documents that are needed from Nalcor. And there's not a lot of time to do this. This has got to be done by September because that's when the inquiry wants to start its public hearings and they want this information to be out there before those public hearings begin. But even if Grant Thornton finds something in its audit, there, that's no guarantee that the inquiry will agree to uh, those same findings. Council for other parties will have an opportunity to cross-examine um, and ask, ask questions of the auditor in presenting the report and really test, test the report and the auditor's conclusions. Ultimately the Commissioner may, may accept all, some or none of uh, what, 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 what's in the report. Since we're talking about money here, how much will this audit cost? Well, Kate O'Brien today wouldn't give a price figure. She said eventually that number will be released. This audit is something that has been a demand from all sorts of opponents for a long time, protesters, the NDP. Uh, it was something that the government said the inquiry could do, but it was ultimately up to Justice Richard LeBlanc to decide whether or not to proceed with it, and he has. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. The community of Howley has running water, but the state of emergency isn't being called off yet. The mayor says he'll leave it in effect at least until next week while crews make repairs to the system. Something failed a week ago, causing the town to lose access to its water supply. Dive teams will be in the area tomorrow morning to start repairs, but for now, people are allowed to use water for laundry, showers and drinking water. Also on the West Coast, several people in Pasadena were forced out of their homes by flooding. Three homes were in jeopardy on the weekend when an ice jam formed in South Brook. Power was cut to the area when the water started to rise around the houses. A front end loader was used to help get those residents to safety. Town workers have been working to redirect the water back into the brook. Well, not many eight-year-olds dream about being on a curling team or a Canadian men's national championship, but Greg Smith did, and uh, now at the age of 21, 
he's about to do just that. He's pretty excited. Smith won the Provincial Men's Tankard Championship in St. John's on the weekend, and that means his team is heading to the Briar. Here now is Jeremy Eaton was there to catch Smith's reaction when his team won. <laughs> I feel incredible. It's absolutely amazing to get to go there at such a young age. I've been dreaming about this ever since I threw my first stone at eight years old. So um, I just am beyond words right now. Oh, it means a lot to me. I'm very, very proud of him. I'm so glad they won. <laughs> this is his dream ever since he was a little boy, and I'm so, so happy for him, and I'm so proud of him. What was the key to your success during this? Uh, consistency during the week, uh, fitness during the week, making sure we had a routine. Uh, I sat the boys down before it started, and we figured out where we were going to eat each day, where we were going, what we were doing before and after the game, so we weren't rushing to and from the, the rink, and we stuck to it. Turn you into our time. Congratulations, guys. We all go to the gym pretty regularly, so we're all in pretty decent shape at the very least. So it definitely helped us not be as tired near the end of the week. Um, I know we were flagging a little bit in the first final last night, but everything worked out well today and it all paid off in the end, so it was definitely worth it. What was it like having the fans on the ice? It's the first time they've done that here. What was it like as one of the players? Uh, I mean, it's just like uh, when we went to juniors way back, or I went there last year, and it's the same atmosphere. You just kind of got to ride it and, you know, hope that it will pump you up like it did. Well, I think Mom is over there bawling her eyes, uh, and I'm surprised I'm not yet either. But, uh, I mean, all of them, they're immensely proud. This is something that, uh, you know, you're lucky to say you go to once in your life, let alone going there at such a young age. We're all in our 20s. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. and. I, I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. See you there. <laughs> well, congratulations yeah. to them. I bet their feet haven't touched the ground yet. <laughs> no, no. I was afraid that there might be an incident. They're hopping up and down there, but at least we didn't have that. But they're going to have their work cut out for them at the Briar. But what a great experience for a young team. Definitely. We will be watching. Well, they braved the cold and joined other angels across Canada to go for the Snow Angel World Record.
tonight's weather forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Carolyn is in for Ryan tonight. Hello. Nice to have you here. Good to see you again. Nice to be here. We're going to talk about Manitoba's cold weather before we talk about our situation. Yeah, yeah about 400 skaters braved frigid Winnipeg temperatures yesterday for a chance at uh, making history. And if you've never been to Winnipeg, it gets <laughs> awfully cold there. And they broke the world record for the longest skating chain. Yes, the previous record was set by a group of 370 skaters in Japan. While the numbers still need to be verified by the Guinness World Records, uh, somewhere between 385 and 395 skaters took part in Winnipeg's chain. Mm, the continuous line of skaters had to travel at least 400 meters without breaking, and those who took part in the event, dubbed Chain for Change, were also encouraged to bring a donation for Cancer Care Manitoba. Yeah, you don't wonderful. want to be the person who falls. No, that's it. <laughs> No, it's got to start all over again. Now, these, these were not the only people trying to set records in the cold on the weekend. Time, 1400 February 3rd, Saturday, minus 40 with wind chill. Oh, my heavens. This is Smoky Mountain in Labrador City, where on Saturday afternoon they tried to beat the Guinness World Record for the most snow angels done at the same time. It was part of Canadian Ski Patrol Day, and similar attempts were done at the same time right across the country. Minus 40, they look like they're trying to surrender. <laughs> uh, as you can see, all the participants had to do was lay down and, well, do what we did when we were kids, make snow angels. And we checked back with the Ski Patrol today, and they say that 54 people took part in Lab City, as you just saw in that video, but they still don't know yet if that number, sort of like the skaters, mm. if that's combined with all the rest of the snow angels across Canada, they don't know yet if that was enough to smash the world record. So it's going to take another couple of days to get all the tallies from all across the country to see if they actually broke that record. So we'll uh, try to keep you posted. And they said minus 40. Do you know that it's going to get even colder Impossible. there? Impossible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, some really cold temperatures you coming move, from Western. Right? You want to keep <laughs> yeah, moving. Yeah, that's a way something. to keep warm for sure. Uh, let's get right to it and uh, see what's in store for the weather. Here's a look at your weather on the way headlines. Wet, windy, and fairly uh, mild and warm for the island uh, tonight. Some extreme cold, as I just mentioned, for Western Labrador and parts of Northern Labrador. And we actually have another bit of a warm up coming later in the week. So I'll get into that a bit later on. But this is the system that's uh, causing some problems for the island tonight. Lots of rain, lots of wind. You can see that it's settling in nicely uh, over the island. Burgio area going to get the most rain, it looks like tonight, but it's also bringing these mild temperatures. Just look at this. Six degrees in Bay Roberts right now. Three degrees in St. John's and right across the island. You can see all of these temperatures above zero. Corner Brook, seven degrees. Now that's all because of these southerly winds uh, coming up. That's keeping everything nice and mild. Not going to last. Going to change overnight tonight. You can see what kind of a difference those winds are making. Uh, Mary's Harbor at zero right now, but just over there in Happy Valley, Goose Bay minus 14. So quite the difference uh, in the temperatures that uh, that those winds are making for sure. So the winds are mild, but they are also going to be very, very strong on the island tonight. You can see here the the the, uh, the winds 120 in St. John's, Port of Basque 130. So there is a wind warning in effect for the entire island tonight. Everyone is going to be seeing a very, very windy night. I could get up to 160 kilometers per hour in the rec house area. The west coast also very strong winds, 140 there. So that will persist throughout the evening and then taper off uh, in the morning hours. We also have heavy rain coming for much of the island. You'll notice that St. John's is not part of this uh, rainfall warning. About 10 to 20 millimeters expected in St. John's, but the south coast will get much more rain. As I mentioned, uh, the Burgio area especially could get up to 110 millimeters of rain tonight. And we have this flash freeze warning in place for uh, the Straits and the Red Bay area. And they put that in when temperatures drop by uh, uh, 12 degrees within three hours. So things are going to cool down really, really fast. 15 to 25 millimeters of rain coming for those areas tonight. So all the rain is going to come down and then it's just going to flash freeze. So whatever you can do, 
to clear away the slush, you're going to want to do that because it's all going to turn to solid, solid ice by the morning. So there's also a wind warning in effect for that area. So it's going to be quite, quite messy for the northern part of uh, uh, the northern peninsula. So we also have a snowfall warning in place for Happy Valley Goose Bay and the Churchill Valley area. The extreme cold I was telling you about, minus 47 with the wind chill. So Lab City and uh, Nain getting very, very cold there uh, tonight into tomorrow. We have that blowing snow warning for uh, along the coast there. Now all of this will clear off overnight tonight and then we're actually in for quite a nice calm day tomorrow. You can see not much on the go on the island or in Labrador. Winds are going to stay pretty calm, mainly sunny skies for most areas. Cooler temperatures, but still not too bad. A few flurries possible for the West Coast. Very chilly, though, in Labrador with those nice clear skies. Minus 24 in Lab C City, much colder, uh, as I mentioned, with that wind chill. So as I said earlier, we are going to be getting another one of these uh, warm ups for later in the week. We're thinking around Thursday, so I'll get into all of those details a bit later. Well, a year ago, CBCNL brought you a groundbreaking look at our public school system. 30 teachers from across Newfoundland and Labrador came to our studio, speaking out for the first time and describing what it's like inside the classroom. The worst thing about teaching is the bureaucracy. Many days I leave my classroom and go home and I feel defeated. How frustrated are you? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I guess it would be about a 1 million. At the end of the day, if you feel like you haven't done everything that you could do, you haven't spoken to every child, you haven't, you know, gotten the chance to go near every child, then at the end of the day, you feel like a failure. Well, now, one year later, there is change in the air. The CBC's Ramona Deering checked back in with four of the teachers. Was it worth it speaking out like you did last year? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think teachers who spoke out were showing a frustration of some of the deficiencies that we perceive to be in the education system. And I think since that time, we've started a conversation amongst our own membership and to the wider audience at large in this province, and I think that's well worth it. Did you hear anything negative? I think, by and large, uh, overwhelmingly, the, the, the response was positive. And, um, and I think it's, it's uh, on a go-forward basis, I, I think it's, it's going to be better for education, this problems and better for the kids. Danielle, did it make a difference for you that you spoke out in this forum last year? Absolutely, it did. Tell me about that. Um, well, for instance, when we were talking about the use of secure schools last year, uh, that's something that schools will use. Uh, what happens is they would say, you know, initiate secure schools. Uh, everybody goes into their rooms, the doors are closed, and, and they're locked. And uh, basically, we go about our teaching or whatever we're doing in our classrooms at the time, but you have to stay in your room. And, and what prompts that action? It could be any number of things. It could be as simple as a spill. Um, it could be a, a behavioral student. It could be an injury. It could be any number of things. Um, in, in many of our schools last year, we had really high numbers. And uh, you would see the secure school being called quite often uh, to deal with a situation where you might have a student who is out of control and they're trying to get the student to where they need to be to keep them safe. And of course, you don't want students hanging around in the hallway, going to the bathroom, things like that. On the other side of it is they also don't get to go to their phys ed and their music if you're in your door, in your classroom, and the door has to be kept closed. In some schools, in my school, we've changed the way we do those things. They didn't realize that it was being called as often as it is because when you're dealing with a situation, you don't necessarily realize that that's affecting everybody else to the amount that it is. Um, so they have different kinds of codes now. They might call for a certain team or they might just uh, do it in certain sections of the building. So uh, what they have done as well is they'll have the specialist teachers go and get the classes if it's okay for your class to go to phys ed or music. So it works a lot better. Yeah, I can see a huge difference in your body language this time around. Absolutely. A year ago, do you remember what you were saying a year ago? I sure do. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of mine and I had kind of coined hashtag defeated. 
and we're kind of living by feeling that we're defeated every day. And it was a pretty unhealthy way to feel, and uh, it, was, uh, it was really challenging going to work every day feeling that way. As a professional and you're dealing with people's children, that's not the way you want to present yourself or the way that you want to feel at the end of the day when you go home. So it was, it was a, challenging, a challenging time in my life for sure. And why were you feeling so defeated? Feeling defeated, uh, class sizes, class composition, the inclusion model that clearly wasn't working, and um, uh, c courses that are not given enough allocation. Um, things like that were, you know, really starting to get at my goat. And because, uh, you know, I work all about, it's about the children, it's about programming for the children. Um, it's not about me, it's, 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 for the, it's for the kids. So when you see opportunities, being taken away from kids uh, be it because of behavioral issues, be it behave because of uh, diverse programming within the confines of one classroom, or because it's reduced programming of a specialist subject. It's really frustrating as a, as a parent and as a teacher. So, fast forward to right now, how are things? Funny enough, um, last year was hashtag defeated, and I've turned it around. I'm hashtag hopeful right now. What? <laughs> yeah, it's a very positive change. Um, because I was kind of in a place last year where I was really feeling not great, uh, you have to make a choice. You can stay there or you can make a change. So I decided on the latter and made a change. Uh, one thing that I did notice is that I was eating in my classroom at lunchtime by myself, which is anyone that knows me knows I'm a very outgoing and energetic person. I thrive off people. And I was eating by myself every day. And I was like, gee, this is really crazy. Like, what's going on? And I, but I craved that silence, that, that silence in the middle of my day, uh, and I kind of craved that, that moment. Then one Saturday morning, I was lying in my bed going, gee, if I'm craving this and I'm thriving from this moment of silence in my day, this, these moments, surely kids have to be feeling this as well. So I uh, opened my classroom at lunchtime um, and entitled it uh, Comfort Cove. And Comfort Cove um, meaning it was a safe place for kids to come away from the storms of the everyday. And in my classroom, we, uh, we would dim the lights and have soft music on, and uh, I would put things up on my smart board about mindfulness and uh, visualization, some basic yoga poses. And uh, uh, kids started coming, and it was really a positive, um, positive experience. So I was lucky, actually, enough to uh, receive an Education Innovators Innovation Award from the Newfoundland Labrador um, Education Foundation. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you. But uh, I was able to get some funding to resource this program. So I was able to get a lot of alternate seating for my kids, um, logic puzzles, uh, sand tables, uh, etch-a-sketches, uh, stress balls, um, and all kinds of resources for the kids to actually come in and take a moment of their day to be actually be able to relax and reflect and rejuvenate to go back out there again. So it's, it's been really positive. But uh, aside from my comfort cove, um, I really found hope in the uh, Premier's Task Force um, recommendations. Um, there, there's a lot of material out there, and there's a lot of uh, information set in those uh, recommendations that are really kind of life-giving to educators and to parents and to students. Um, uh, they, they recognize that the inclusion model isn't working. So even to have that in print and to have an outside uh, group of people you know, state this to the government, the government to put this out in their report. It's like we're at the cusp of a new beginning, that we're going to make strides in improving the system for our kids, and that's the bottom line. That's what we need to do. Really interesting uh, discussion. Yeah, Seems a lot has changed yep. in one year. And we're not done yet. In about four minutes, we'll hear about a new policy where students actually lose marks for handing assignments in late.
Welcome back to Here and Now, back to our one year check in on our Inside the Classroom series. Now, the teacher whose frustration levels with inclusive education were sky high a year ago, how are they now? You were incredibly frustrated. H how are things now? We want what's best for the kids. We want them. Uh, and we, we, we think that each and every one of them deserve, uh, you know, the optimum learning environment. Um, and we, they weren't getting it, unfortunately. And um, I think as teachers, we, we can all agree that the inclusive model um, done properly uh, it certainly can be effective, but uh, it certainly wasn't coming, it wasn't working that way. Um, the Premier's Task Force uh, is, is a fantastic document. I've read it uh, cover to cover. We are very hopeful as educators that um, we, we see now that the inclusive model wasn't working um, and, and uh, they, the professionals have identified uh, what we can do to make it better. Um, we're just hoping that um, it comes to fruition and, and we see it uh, getting rolled out the way that it's meant to be. So you realize you're throwing the word hopeful around and you are the very ma same man who said a year ago uh, when I asked you on a scale of 1 to 10 how frustrated you were with the education system, and you quoted 1 million. On, on, on has part. anything changed in your teaching world or for the teachers around you that you know? Um, not necessarily. Uh, you know, my frustration level has gone down knowing that the, the issues that need to be addressed um, are being finally being looked at. Um, you know, it, it's going to come back to funding, uh, and, and and we need human resources, and we need the, uh, the the resources within the school to to do our jobs. But my frustration level has gone down substantially, um, just based on the fact that uh, we now we've addressed those issues, and uh, and we know that they're there. Now we're we're just hoping that people give us the tools that we need to do our job. Let's talk about another policy that changed. Uh, a year ago when we were talking, Gabe, students could hand in their assignments late and they would not lose any marks as a consequence. In fact, they could hand their assignments in very late in the school year. That has now been changed. So, what do you think of that? I certainly think it's a good thing. It's a return to where we were, or close to where we were in the past. Uh, you know, students when they're young in particular and adults alike, I mean, we all need to have some responsibility and, uh, and we need to know that, you know, deadlines need to be honored. When they leave school and go to colleges and universities, they're not going to get extensions without any kind of penalty. So the evaluation policy now has, you know, we, we accept it on the, on the due date. After that, there will be, if there are no extenuating circumstances for the lateness or tardiness, they, uh, the, um, there's the possibility of reduction in marks. And students are, are owning up to that. They're, we knew they would. Uh, they were telling us for years that this was silliness, that the, the students who were ready to get to work in on time were telling us that they, they thought it was just silly, that there was an extended period that was, could potentially go months. You know? And uh, so now we have a policy that, uh, that has a little more teeth, but you know, uh, teachers and, and, the, uh, and the personnel at school district and, and at the department who discussed this, nobody wants to be punitive with children. You know, everybody wants to give children a fair shake. And uh, if they have a, a legitimate reason for lateness, because there's all kinds of things going on in child, children's lives right now, uh, we will honor that. Uh, but now we have an ability to say, okay, enough is enough, and we, um, you know, uh, you are responsible to get your work done on time wherever possible, certainly. So what I'm hearing from you for is that everything's peachy in the education system. No, I certainly wouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> Like I said before, you know, we still have, there's, there, it's, it's, uh, it's a hill we got to climb. We're still, we're still climbing. But um, it seems, with the Premier's Task Force uh, document that was released, it seems like um, there, our issues are being addressed. Um, peachy, no, but uh, in, heading in the right direction, yes. There's still work to be done uh, with the way that supports are, are given out. I truly believe, as I said last year, it would be nice to have a budget for behaviors and academics um, so that everybody gets what they need. That's, that's the end of the day. Students need to get what they need. I want to thank you all so much for coming in with this update. There's been a lot of change in a year, it sounds like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
I guess the important thing was starting that conversation a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, shining a light on it, and yeah. at least those optimism. teachers. Optimism. Yeah. Optimism they, is good to see. Now, see, interesting to see if you get some significant measurable change, but it looks mm -hmm. as though teachers think things are headed the right way. Now, if you want to hear more about teacher Angela Dawes' Comfort Cove project, you can read her commentary online at cbc.ca slash nl. It doesn't just end in the courtroom. Jurors remember what they see. A look at the cost of justice for jurors. The aquaculture industry here says it just can't be done. Land-based salmon farms can't turn a profit. Well, don't tell that to Nordic Aqua Farms. There's been a bit of a shift in mentality on the investment side. That Norwegian company is investing in the state of Maine to build a 40-acre land-based salmon farm in the United States. Eventually, they're looking at $500 million in total. The trial started today for a group of men charged with a string of violent home invasions last year. They face more than 100 charges stemming from four incidents. It's alleged that they tied people up, shot a dog and stole money. But the trial got underway with the defense challenging how the police obtained some evidence without a warrant. The CBC's Ryan Cook has more. Five men had just robbed a home on Angels Road in Paradise. Police were told they were armed and they were fleeing the scene. For the first time on Monday, a court heard some of what happened next. Just down the street, police found a Mazda 3 stuck in the snow. Inside, they found Mitchell Nippard's government ID, but no sign of Mitchell Nippard. They then got a call about a suspicious vehicle near Buckingham Drive, very close to the home on Angels Road. When they went to check it out, they found Nippard and Gary Hennessy inside a Mitsubishi Lancer. Now here's where things get a little sticky. As officers are detaining Hennessy, his iPhone rings. An officer reaches into his pocket, takes out the phone, and sees a message from a man named Tyler saying he's on the CBS highway. The Crown alleges this man is Tyler Donahue, sharing his location after the men split up following the home invasion. But the defense lawyers argue the officer did not have the right to take that phone since Hennessy was not under arrest at that time. The Crown says the officer performed a search to ensure his own safety and did not press any buttons on the phone. The message was just there in plain sight. 
Now, that text was part of the basis for a later search warrant, which will provide some of the evidence we'll see in this trial. The judge is expected to rule on whether or not that text message is admissible tomorrow morning. If it isn't, that could be the defense's first blow against that search warrant. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Now, one other note there to Ryan's story. There was another development this morning as one of the accused chose to represent himself. Abdi Fatah Mohammed let go of his lawyer before the trial got underway. The Toronto man faces 32 charges of break and enter, robbery, assault with a weapon, animal cruelty, and more. The words used to describe how Marcel Reardon died were powerful enough. Repeated blows to the head, enough to smash his skull. Now, imagine what the photos look like. Juries are often made to examine things the average person would never have to see. Ordinary people given an extraordinary task. It begs the question, what help is there, there for them? Here now is Ariana Kellen reports, but first a warning, what you're about to see may be disturbing to some. A traumatic moment signifying the end of a life. Gruesome images, bodies riddled with bullets and stab wounds prepared for autopsy. She's dying and the cops are here. It was an accident. It was an accident. First-hand raw accounts of murder and abuse, sometimes so awful it's banned from public ears and eyes. But the dozen or so ordinary people selected to sit on a jury have no choice but to watch, review, examine, and consume it, all in the name of their civic duty. So when a verdict is reached, you think that there would be help for jurors. It turns out that's not the case. Services, or lack thereof, vary right across the country. Here in this province, there is no post-trial support, but government says it will work with the courts on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. It's a scenario playing out in the St. John's courtroom. Some jurors at the Ann Norris trial asked if they'd get help for what they'd inevitably have to see. Graphic images of Marcel Reardon's body. The judge said not right now. They aren't allowed to discuss the case outside of the jury room. So are we asking too much of ordinary people? That sacrifice, as we're seeing, and, you know, as should be self-evident, doesn't just end in the courtroom. Jurors remember what they see. They remember what they've experienced. That emotional trauma can stay with them long after the verdict is read. And according to Spratt, they should be compensated for it. This means access to treatment and counseling and a realization that that uh, the government should be um, supporting jurors so they don't have to experience any out-of-pocket uh, financial consequences for engaging in that treatment. I spoke with a man who sat on a jury here in 2014. He was downtown working when he was handed a summons and he was selected, an unlucky lottery, an event that he says changed his life, but such is the cost of justice. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's not a skidoo and it's not a motorbike, but as you can see, it can really move.
It is time now to introduce our Young Athlete of the Day, and this is Cole Hernan of St. Lawrence. Cole is seven years old, and he loves to play soccer with the St. Lawrence Minor Soccer Program, and Cole also enjoys swimming. Congratulations, Cole. You are today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. say necessity is the mother of invention that certainly appears to be the case for a young man in Hopedale. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you miss using your dirt bike in the winter? Well, you build a snoter bike, of course. <laughs> okay, that's what uh, Braden Frieda has done. He found the idea for a snow bike. It's a combination of a dirt bike and a snowmobile on the internet. He explained his contraption to here and now's Jacob Barker. Tell me about what you're sitting on right now. A dirt bike with a ski on there. Me and my friend made it. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to try something different. It, it doesn't look comfortable to ride. It looks like kind of kind of slipping, slipping, sliding around. Yeah, it needs a little bit harder snow. How'd you think this up? I just saw the snow bikes on the internet and just wanted to try. What's it like riding it? Like, what's the challenge? It's good. Just kind of hard, so. What kind of things have you heard about it? They're saying it's cool and first time seeing it. Like, have you, have you ever fallen over? Uh, sometimes. When I was driving kind of crazy. <laughs> Is it fun though? Yeah. Yeah, I'd fall on my face for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Kind of fun, it though. does yeah, look fun. Very, very good of him. Very inventive. Yep, it must have taken a lot of time to do it. Mm -hmm. So good yeah. on you. Yeah, nice. well done. And lots of snow in Happy Valley Goose Bay for sure. Snowfall warning in effect. Let's uh, have a look at uh, the forecast, shall we? Just wanted to start with some current temperatures across North America. We're sitting at four degrees in St. John's right now. Not too bad. If you have some uh, family down in Florida, a nice 22 degrees there right now. So of course, lovely in Florida right now. Uh, uh, and current temperatures across the island, it's just amazing, uh, these temperatures all above zero. This uh, Cape Race number, I think that's wrong. <laughs> 21 degrees, no, not in Cape Race, but 4 degrees in St. John, 7 degrees in Cornerbrook, much cooler in uh, Lab West, minus 22 degrees in Lab City. So we do have that wind warning in effect for tonight. Worst hit, of course, the Rec House area uh, gusts up to 160, 140 along uh, the coast, but the entire island affected by these really strong southerly winds. We have the rainfall warning in effect. Virgio area going to be the hardest hit with all that frozen uh, ground out there. There could be some flooding, lots of slush, upwards of 110 millimeters for the Virgio area and up along the coast there. St. John's could see about 10 to 20 uh, tonight and 25 to 55 for the southern Avalon. We have that flash freezing warning, as I mentioned earlier, for the Straits area. So lots of rain going to come down and then it's going to just freeze really, really quickly and turn to solid ice. So it's going to be a very icy day there tomorrow for sure. But of course, we have the blowing snow warning along the coast and the extreme cold warning for Labrador City and uh, up through Churchill Falls and Nain, minus 47 uh, as uh, the wind chill there. So yes, very, very uh, cold for sure. So looking ahead to tomorrow, we're, we're in for a beautiful day actually for the island. Mostly uh, sunny skies, temperatures uh, minus one in St. John's, minus four in Grand Falls, Windsor. A chance of some flurries along the west there. Very, very cold still uh, in Lab City, but it will be uh, nice and sunny, so it'll be cool and crisp uh, and bright. Uh, then we're looking ahead to Wednesday. We do have uh, some snow, some flurries moving in for the island and uh, for the Straits area, so that won't last too long, and then it'll, it'll clear off, so chance of flurries on Wednesday. Temperatures on the island uh, between minus five and zero, and those temperatures uh, staying really chilly uh, in Labrador there, minus 24 for Western uh, Labrador. And then we get into Thursday, and this is interesting because we have uh, some of the, the snow and cloud cover moving up, and then we have another one of these 
kind of systems where we had those southerly winds and you can see the mix of snow and rain and then turning to rain on Thursday. So we're going to see another dose of those fairly mild temperatures. We're looking at five degrees with a mix of snow and rain uh, for Thursday and uh, some snow and rain for across the island. Uh, not going to see any of that in Labrador. We're going to stay really crisp and cold there. Then things will dip back down again as we move into the weekend with some flurries there and things will stay uh, pretty consistent for Labrador with uh, some sunshine, some flurries and temperatures. Very, very cold, Debbie. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Well, this national news story to tell you about Carolyn, uh, Caroline Mulroney, daughter of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, has joined the Conservative leadership race in Ontario. People are really looking for something different. Um, although I haven't, uh, people haven't seen me on the floor of a legislature before, that doesn't mean that I don't have the skills and the uh, qualifications to, to lead. Um, I've just been doing it behind closed doors. Mulrooney is a lawyer, businesswoman, and mother of four. She joins two other candidates running to lead Ontario's Conservatives into a June 7th provincial election. Doug Ford, a former Toronto City Councillor and brother of the late Mayor Rob Ford, and Christine Elliott, former MPP and widow of the late Federal Finance Minister Jim Flaherty. The new Ontario PC leader will be chosen on March 10th. Here's a look at your viewer picture of the day. I thought this was a nice, fun <laughs> picture. Some young guys out enjoying the freshly fallen snow. I'll let you know where that photo was taken after the break. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, that was an interesting shot you showed us. Yeah, you know, lots of things to enjoy about winter, and these uh, these guys are certainly enjoying the winter weather. So, any nice. guesses of where this might be? It's a lot of snow, yeah. so west coast or the big land. And not way in the wilderness. Look at all the nope. power That's, lines. Oh, very observant, Debbie. <laughs> this is uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So, uh, yeah, great shot there. Nice action shot sent to us uh, from Beverly Woodward. Minus, Minus 35, oh. <laughs> she said it was. No wonder they're jumping. <laughs> wow, what a great shot. Well, at least they're having winter weather to enjoy. Yeah, they can play Unlike in it. Like us on the Avalon, where it's snow, rain, snow, freezing rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I bitter? Uh, <laughs> not one bit. No, not at all, not at all. Anyway, thanks for sending in that shot. And nice to have 
have you here. Yeah. Maybe we'll be back tomorrow. We'll, we'll see. see. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.